So I've shown you the simplest case of looking at the mathematician's Laplacian, which is just minus the second derivative in one dimension, and taking a square root of it. Let's go to two dimensions, and the story is uh, similar in three dimensions and, and higher, and it really has an n-dimensional generalization. Um, but let's let's concentrate on two dimensions. So again, it's the sum of the sec the unmixed partial second partials. That's the usual definition of Laplacian. So it's uh, in other words, it's minus the nabla squared notation, if you're used to that. And as I said, many mathematicians, not all, but many mathematicians put a minus sign in front of that, and it turns out that makes it a positive operator. Again, um, and if you do set up the analog of like eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which I may I may talk about a little more. Um, it makes the spectrum positive. The eigenvalues are positive. Um, and so the, the question is, is there a square root for this guy? And the first systematic treatment of this was in physics, actually Dirac, coming up with the Dirac equation for relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, he was very interested in this kind of question, although he actually did it for a somewhat a variant of the Laplacian. Um, and it turns out to be an amazing story that informs a huge amount of, of modern uh, physics and mathematics. And so I wanted to give you a taste of it uh, because I realized it really is a natural generalization of what we were doing. Okay, so it turns out um, that just like we had to use and introduce i and complex numbers to make it work in one dimension, we have to introduce new algebra as well here. And here's what we have to do: instead of thinking of of u, it's just it's just plain not going to work if u is an ordinary function with either real or just complex values. What we do is we make it into a vector. So it's the usual mathematician's trick of if it, things don't seem to be working, change the rules. Um, and, and I hope that it still is useful for the application that you were already working on. And that's often, often true. Okay. Um, so we're going to take uh, u is a vector. with So u1 is a function, u2 is a function. And then it's still the same if you want to take delta of it. You just do this operation to the first component and the second component separately. Nothing really special. Okay. And now we're going to assume, we're going to hope, we're going to basically guess, or if you, the physicists say ansatz, because in uh, German it sounds so much fancier. We're going to hope that there's two matrices. Let's say A, um, AX, because it's going to be associated with the derivative in the X variable. Let me just write it out and then explain what I'm talking about. So, amuse um, yourself for a few seconds here. Okay. Check your, check the text on your phone. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay. So, um, so there's going to be, let's assume that we can look at, a, we have a first order differential operator. Sounds fancy, but all of that means is something where we take the two functions made consider as a vector, we take the extra partial derivative of that, and we're going to multiply it by some constant coefficient matrix A. And that's going to have the effect of mixing up. It's going to be like maybe du1 dx might end up being in the bottom slot, and du2 dx might end up being in the top slot, but then there's also going to be unmixed stuff. And then similarly, we're going to look at the y derivatives u1 u2, multiply them by some 2 by 2 constant coefficient matrix and mix things up in some way. And we'll get some uh, new vector whose coefficients are just basically some arbitrary combination of x and y derivatives u1 and u2. That's, a, that's all, all this says. Okay. Now, what happens if we do that twice? And we, we want to match it to this guy. Okay. So, not a super hard computation. And... Um, I'm not. I'm trying to be pretty cavalier about things, so apologize if it gets a little bit difficult. But trying to give a whirlwind tour, um, and again, pause it and see what happens. Try to put do this twice to something. You get ax squared, that matrix squared, usual matrix multiplication, times this, the second derivative in x of u1, u2, plus, and then you get two cross terms, as always when you square a binomial. But you have to be very careful because matrices do not commute. You know what? I'm going to need to put that on the next line so it's not too confusing. So here's the real power of, of this idea of, oh, maybe it could be a, a, a two-component vector. We actually really want the non-commutativity here. Now, I'm going to, this, this guy, uh, differentiation does commute. That's Clairaut's theorem. Some people call it Clairaut's theorem. I, the book I teach out of calls it Clairaut's theorem, although it's not a very good attribution. Um, 
that d squared dx dy and dy dx are both the same, so they can be combined, but these matrices do not commute, and so they'll give you, um, we have to write it out that way. I can't just write that as like 2ax ay, as in like a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Okay, and then the similar thing here with the unmixed, another unmixed partial. Okay, and what do we want that to be? We just want that to be minus d squared dx squared if you want you to, and minus d squared dy squared, something very simple of u on u2. Okay, so what does that mean? We're just going to match the things. I need the matrix ax squared to be minus the identity matrix. Because this guy didn't mix the u1 and u2. It doesn't doing anything complicated in terms of the algebra. It's just taking the second derivatives. And so this should be the minus the identity matrix. And that should be the same as ay squared. So these two mystery matrices that I'm trying to invent to come up with this algebra should have that property. And this guy should totally die. I don't want a mixed partial. The whole point of Laplacian is no mixed partials. And so I want AX, AY to be minus AY, AX. So this, hopefully, is reminiscent of inventing complex numbers. I need something that squares to minus 1, or here it's minus the identity matrix. Now, with matrices, it's it can be a little easier to actually do this. And you might, it's not obvious that we're going to have to introduce complex numbers. Well, we really are going to have to introduce complex numbers to do to achieve all of this. Okay. Um, and they're, they're really going to be two by two matrices with complex entries. But what I actually want to do is I want to really take seriously this idea this, through these whole talks of inventing new algebra. I'm going to actually go away for a second from the idea that these are two by two, com two by two matrices at all and just say, I want some kind of algebra. I'm going to take, take advantage of this analogy here that this is acting a little bit like good old fashioned I. Okay, so I'm going to invent just a formal algebra, formal algebraic system, just like inventing I was, okay, with, uh, it's going to have one, and i, and j, and k, okay? Um, and really, the, the i and the j are going to be the most the most direct correspondence here, and we'll see you know, we're going to need a k as well. And so, in other words, uh, a number in this algebraic system is going to be something like a sub 0 times 1, so I don't need to write the 1, plus a1i plus a2j plus a3k. And what do I need to tell you in order to do algebra? Well, adding is going to be very simple. Like, just group the i's, j's, and k's, and the and the, the constant, the the non, the ordinary terms, the real numbers together. And then I just need to tell you how to do multiplication. And I I just say the distributive law works, all the usual laws work, except we're going to see one law it does break down. Um, and I just need to tell you how to multiply the i's, and j's, and k's. Well, I'm going to just use these formal rules. I'm going to say i squared should be minus one. Well, thank God. Otherwise, it'd be really confusing. But this new guy, j, it should also square to minus 1, because this is going to be kind of a placeholder for the formal behavior that this ay matrix has. And what does this say? It says that ij it sh should be anti-commutative, at least for these guys. In general, it's just, it's just kind of not commutative. Okay, and this is pretty, this is a little wacky. This is not something we were forced to do at all when we introduced complex numbers to say, well, throw out the commutative law. Here we are forced to throw out the commutative law and have something different. And uh, this ij, it's very, very helpful to have its own name for it, and that's k. We're going to call that k. Okay, um, and in fact, let's see, what about k squared? Hmm. k squared is, well, it's ij, ij. Turns out we don't have to throw out the associative law, so I don't have to put any parentheses. And so I can switch the j and the i at the expense of a minus sign. That's minus i squared j squared. Oh, minus, 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 that's also minus 1. So that's cool. Okay. So um, we've got this, uh, this system where all three of these guys, i, j, and k, all square to minus 1. And then uh, there's at least this interesting thing about non-commutativity. Okay, uh, we could go through the other rules, but let me just, oh, I shouldn't erase that, well, maybe. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to really let d be i d by dx plus j d by dy. And that's in this formal kind of, this formal algebra that sort of tells us the fundamental rules. And then I implement that 
or what's called, mathematicians call it a representation of this formal set of rules as d equals ax d by dx plus ay d by dy. And notice I'm, I'm, I'm shorthanding things a little bit. This really means du equals ax d by dx of u plus a by ay d by dy of u. And it's a very common shorthand when you talk about operators to not even um, put in the u, the, thing, the, the function that you're going to be operating on. And the key is that these rules, these formal rules that are true for i and j, they're supposed to be satisfied by ax and ay. And the cool thing is, the, the flexibility that gains you is that there's actually not a unique answer to the question we just had about these 2 by 2 matrices. If you're expecting me to say, here is the one and only one answer for what AX and AY could be to make this a square root of the Laplacian, here isn't a unique answer, although I'll give you one in a second. But what is unique is that they have to satisfy this, they have to be of this form with this kind of template, and those template entries have to satisfy this form, these formal rules of algebra. Um, and so let me show you an example. Very common example would be um, to let AX equal, let me look at my cheat sheet here for which one, yeah. That 2 by 2 complex matrix. Turns out if you really hate complex numbers, God knows why you would do this if you hate complex numbers. But if you want to do it with real matrices, you actually have to go to 4 by 4 real matrices. Which is not too shocking because it turns out that complex numbers can be represented as 2 by 2 real matrices. Um, and then AXAY, if you calculate it out, is, I'm going to cheat, yeah, minus I, 0, 0, I. Okay. So let me, uh, in case you know anything about, if you've seen anything like this, you're probably being like, why doesn't he, isn't he saying certain words? Okay. Um, these are related to, they're not exactly the same, there's a factor of i that you have to fudge in a certain way. These are called the Pauli matrices. And they have to do with quantum mechanical spin, and what are called spinners. And this, this guy u1, u2, this fact that we had to make take what we thought was going to be just an ordinary function and turn it into a vector, with two components, and complex components at that, is the realization that when you do physics, for example, quantum mechanics, you have to take a wave function and to incorporate what really happens in what's called spin, quantum mechanical spin, you have to turn it into a, a two-component gadget, or sometimes three or four or five or whatever, but this is the simplest way, okay? Uh, and then I mentioned Dirac. Um, this operator, this square root of the Laplacian is called a Dirac operator. Anything of this version, there's other ways of taking square roots of operators that are quite different, but this version of taking a Dirac of a, of a square root of Laplacian by introducing new formal algebra um, is called creating a Dirac operator. And uh, the formal algebra, where you don't worry about exactly how to implement it with good old-fashioned ordinary matrices, I squared equals J squared um, equals K squared. And it turns out it's also equal to IJK equals minus 1. Um, there's a couple of names for this. Well, one, the most famous name for this particular example is called the quaternions. This is a very natural step after R. And then the real numbers and the complex numbers, they're actually called H for Hamilton because he invented them in the 19th century after a lot, lot long struggle. Um, and I think I mentioned this already. <laughs> Was it just yesterday I recorded that video? Um, that um, it's the next stage in one version of this story of creating new number systems. And we've seen that one reason to create that number system is to create the correct kind of formal algebra that lets you invent a Dirac operator. In that context, it's actually called a special case of what's called a Clifford algebra. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I talked about this in just that last video, or a couple videos ago, um, and I promised it would come back, and here it is. Okay, so the most uh, obvious, the most direct reason for inventing what's called Clifford algebras, um, and these these 
generalizations of the complex numbers is what I want to think of them as, is this idea of creating uh, a Dirac operator. And they're immensely useful in physics. They're absolutely crucial to understand physical um, particles in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Um, and they it turned out, after a while, people realized they had these am amazing uses in pure mathematics as well. And they, they'd really help transform uh, the field of differential geometry and, and topology um, in the 60s. Um, and so you'll, uh, you'll see a fair number of presentations of this story of starting at R, going to C, and then going to H, the quaternions, and then maybe they'll talk about the octonions. That's an O with the little the blackboard bold style. Um, and that's something I don't want to focus on right here. And it's, it's very cool stuff, but it's a little obscure, um, pretty specialized. Um, and it stops there. It's not an infinite sequence of, of algebras, and it doesn't work in every dimension. It's only one, two, four, and eight dimensions. Um, but what's, what's, I think, in some ways a better generalization or a better story to tell is the story of Clifford algebras, which I might tell more about in some other video. But this is a very, very basic introduction to it, that um, we've seen that to create the square root of just plain minus y double prime, you have to introduce i. And to take the square root of the Laplacian that um, the good, the mathematician's Laplacian, you notice how I just equated good with mathematics, I like that. Um, to take the square root of that, we were forced to create more complicated new kinds of numbers, which happen to be the quaternions, but more deeply they're actually just the case of Clifford algebras arising from two dimensions. And then if we tried to do this with x, y, and z, we would end up creating the next up level of Clifford algebras and x, y, z, and w, or whatever we talk about. We start talking about the whole family of Clifford algebras in all dimensions. And uh, that's a good place to stop. Thank you.